morning, afternoon, and good evening to all speakers, chairs, and the wonderful audiences in different parts of the world. Welcome to the SNS webinar. The speaker for the first session today is our distinguished and honored guest and senior faculty from Italy, Professor Francisco Di Meco. Professor Di Meco is the director of first division of neurosurgery at the Fonzione IRCCS Instituto Neurologico Sibesta Milan. He is also assistant professor of neurosurgery at the John Hopkins uh, Medical School and the Associate Professor of Neurosurgery at the University of Milan. He is a member of the Society of Neurological Sur Surgeons of Italy as well as the CNS, AANS and the WFNS. He is specialized in the management of brain tumors, skull based surgery and spine surgery uh, of tumor. He had won several awards and honored for his outstanding contribution towards neurosurgery in his country. We are extremely honored to have him today at our webinar, and he will be talking about application of ultrasound in neurosurgery from intraoperative imaging to treatment. The speaker of the second session today webinar is our honored guest from the United States of America, Professor Hamid Brohi Razavi. Professor Hamid is the Director of Minimal Invasive Prenatal and Pituitary Surgery Program at Cleveland Clinic Florida, Research Director of the Neuroscience Institute of the Cleveland Clinic Florida Region and Assistant Professor of Neurological Surgery at Cleveland Clinic Learner College of Medicine, specialized in brain tumor surgery, open and endoscopic skull-based surgery, pituitary surgery, and trigeminal neuralgia. He had completed two clinical fellowships in neurosurgical oncology and advanced open and endoscopic skull-based surgery at Cleveland Clinic, Ohio. Dr. Hamid has authored more than 110 peer review publication and book chapter and is on the editorial board of multiple journals. He also received multiple national and international awards and scholarship in recognition of this accomplishment. We are extremely honored today to have him today at our webinar and today he'll be talking about minimally invasive brain surgery, integration of anatomy, knowledge and technology for better outcome. The chair for the first session today of our webinar is our honored guest from Germany, Professor Klaus Resch. Professor Resch had his medical education from world-renowned neurosurgeon like Professor Yasage and Professor Paneski. He started his work in clinical anatomy and established a surgical simulation concept and training environment. He blossomed and refined endoscopic anatomy for neurosurgery under Professor Paneski and progressed to endoscopy surgery a simulation technique for aneurysm, which later become basic of endoscopic assisted micro uh, surgery. He meritorious uh, career includes many firsts, uh, including uh, introduction of endoscopic ultrasound into minimally invasive neurosurgery to navigate endoscopic in complex hydrocephalus. He has also developed the ICH evacuation concept and technique for minimally invasive neurosurgery. We are extremely thankful to him for accepting our invitation to chair the session of Professor Francisco Dimeco. The chair of the second session today of, of our webinar is our only guest from India, Professor Biji Bahaluyan. Professor Biji is the senior consultant in neurosurgery at the Medical Trust Hospital, Kochi, India. He was a former fellow of neurosurgical oncology and minimally invasive neurosurgery at the Cleveland Clinic, Ohio. He was also a former associate professor at the Sri Achitra Tiruna Institute of Medical Sciences, Trivadrum. He has published several articles in various peer review journal and book chapters. We are extremely thankful to him for accepting our invitation to chair the session of Professor Amin. On behalf of the Education Committee of the SNS and the President, Professor Giacomo, I would like to welcome both speaker and chairs and the audience to this online pla uh, SNS platform. Uh, well, welcome to our colleague in China, and we are extremely thankful to Professor Zubin for broadcasting this webinar on WeChat channel. With that introduction, I would like to hand over this online podium to our first uh, chair, Professor Klaus Aresh. Professor, please. I also welcome all you all of you and I'm very happy to be with you and also I welcome of course the audience and uh, I am very happy that uh, Professor Di Meco will talk about uh, endoscopy in neurosurgery in intraoperative application because uh, in my uh, key concept uh, I uh, I think the ultrasound is a key technique for MIM and it is the most underestimated key technique in MIM and therefore I am very happy that uh, Professor D. Meko will uh, give us a lecture on this topic. Please go ahead. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Klaus. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you to Dr. Liu and uh, all the organizers of this meeting. I'm very happy to be here. I'm proud and honored uh, to uh, speak about uh, ultrasound. And what I'm trying to do, what I will try to do today is to try to embrace the whole world of ultrasound uh, in a neurosurgery. So, uh, I would like to give you also some hints about the possible uh, application out, outside the op uh, operatory uh, field. So um, here, is here is an overview of what I would like to talk to you. I would like to briefly speak about the intraoperative imaging, the devices that we have uh, available and uh, then I would like to talk about how to use intraoperative ultrasound, giving you some uh, practical tips and tricks on how to use intraoperative ultrasound. Then I would like to mention the topic of uh, training in the field of intraoperative ultrasound. And uh, at the end, I will mention what are possible future uh, applications for uh, uh, ultrasound. So when we speak about the ultrasound, we speak about the image guided surgery, which as you know, is an aid in order to increase the extent of the resection of brain tumors. So the mainstays of the image guided surgery are neural navigation, the intraoperative MRI, the use of fluorescence and intraoperative ultrasound. So, Let's briefly review each of them. Neural navigation. Neural navigation is based on pre-acquired imaging. It's based on standard imaging. So for all of us, it's very, uh, we are all very acquainted to the kind of imaging. Its use is now routine. However, since it's based on pre-operative imaging, this is not a true online imaging. It's not a, a real-time navigation, but it's rather a virtual navigation, and it does not take into account the brain shift phenomenon. The intraoperative MRI has been regarded now as the gold standard for intraoperative imaging, and of course, it's based on the most reliable kind of imaging that we uh, deal with, which is the MRI. Uh, it is extremely accurate. However, requires a dedicated area, dedicated tools. It is time consuming. It is expensive. It cannot be considered the true dynamic online uh, interoperative imaging. Fluorescence. Let's take a look to fluorescein. Fluorescein is real time, is inexpensive. However, it marks the interstitial space, not tumor cells. So this raises a lot of concern about the uh, specificity of this kind of a uh, technique. 5LA on the other end is also real time, but marks tumor cells. So it's much more reliable as, com as, uh, as compared to fluorescein. However, it works only on high-grade gliomas and can only be visualized over the surface. You cannot see uh, through one millimeter depth of, the, um, of what you're seeing, of your uh, field. And finally, we have intraoperative ultrasound. So why intraoperative ultrasound in neurosurgery? Several reasons. First of all, let's uh, um, consider that ultrasound is the most diffused imaging modality medicine because it provides real-time high-resolution images in almost every setting and anatomical district, for instance, the, the thorax, the limbs, abdomen, and uh, uh, whatever. And the CNS, owing to some optical, uh, optimal mechanical and acoustic properties, it is the ideal substrate for ultrasound propagation and uh, for the image generation. And most and foremost, it's also quite inexpensive. So the interest um, among neurosurgeons is raising, as, as you can tell from a growing number of uh, publications per year, you can see here, 2021, there were many publications, if you look at at the keyword ultrasound and uh, neurosurgery implemented. This is due to the recent 
dramatic improvement of the quality of the image, of the resolution and the definition of the uh, image. However, it's still an unusual imaging to which as a neurosurgeon with not uh, a custom, there are difficulties with the orientation. We are accustomed to uh, watch it and, and look at the MRI firms in the three classical orthogonal planes, but here you have uh, hundreds of different orientations you can deal with. And there, are, there is also the problem, the problem of uh, image artifacts. And as a matter of fact, even for an experienced neurosurgeon can be very difficult to identify all the anatomical structure that you can see depicted in, in this scan, for instance, unless you don't have a coplanar MRI. If you have a coplanar MRI, it becomes evident that here, this is the, the, the solid part of the tumor. This is the choroid plexus. This is the uh, edge of the tentorium. Here you can see the cerebellum with the ostra you can see the hyper echogenicity of the pineal gland. And here you can see the brain stem, for instance. Here is another example. If you have a coplanar MRI, you can see and identify better, especially if you fuse the images together, that this is the solid component. This is a cystic component. This is the fox. This is the tentorium. Here you can see the cerebellum. Uh, here you can see uh, the, the brain stem, and this is uh, the contralateral uh, uh, hemisphere. And uh, here are the uh, this anatomical structure that I just mentioned. So if you have a software like we did, uh, we took advantage of an, uh, a software which is called Virtual Navigator, which was uh, originally conceived for the body, and we adapted this uh, uh, software to the brain so we can have a coplanar MR images, and you can even fuse together uh, MR pre-acquired MR images uh, and uh, real-time intraoperative ultrasound uh, scan. So here are some tips. Uh, when you start, and you're about to start your resection, first of all, if you can take advantage of an integrated system of intraoperative ultrasound with conventional neural navigation. Then when you start um, scanning, uh, usually we do that when the dura is still intact, start doing it along the classical orthogonal planes. So you start with the actual plane, as you can see here, you see the tumor, you see the cyst, you see the choroid plexus, which is always uh, hyperechoic, for instance. And here in this other example, you can see very well the fox, of the, again, let me go back. Yes, here you can see the tumor, you can see the fox, you can see the uh, rectum sinus, uh, the uh, tentorium, the, the outro of the cerebellum over here. And more importantly, you can adjust also for the brain shift. As you can see, if we have the two plates uh, super important, you can see that the two images, they are not perfectly overlapping. This is due to the brain shift. You just freeze one of them. You drag it over and you repeat this several times and you can adjust for the brain shift. I show you another example. Here probably there was also some registration problem. As you can see on the right, right side, here the two images for the fox, they're not overlapping. So you freeze one of the image, you drag it over the other and you adjust for the brain shift. Then you can also uh, use more uh, advanced navigation imaging system, for instance, uh, DTI and photography. You can also uh, fuse uh, uh, with functional MRI, as you can see. This is uh, the aqua fasciculum, and here you can see the motor pathway and how this is related to the uh, brain tumor. So, those are some uh, uh, articles. You may, if you're interested, you may want to uh, go through. So. Here are some additional tips uh, for the scanning before resection. First of all, start scanning following orthogonal plans. Then remember, this is a dynamic tool. So you need to move your probe. You have to bend it, you have to twist it, you have to scroll through uh, the field in order to understand it, to reconstruct in your mind the, um, the, the hysterical come the static uh, configuration of the anatomy. Then you may want to find the target, 
you want to define your target, identifying the boundaries, for instance, and you, uh, you want to identify some key anatomical structures which possess uh, specific uh, semiotic features. For instance, the sulci, gyri, the hausra. Then you want to see the choroid plexus, which is always uh, hyperchoic. You want to see the pineal gland, which is always hyperchoic. The brainstem, which is always very hypoechoic. Then the farx and the tentorium, which is hyperchoic, and the vessels, which usually display this classic uh, railway track kind of uh, uh, image. And then you may want to adjust also for the brain shape. Then there are some additional features you can uh, uh, use, for instance, a Doppler, elastosonography, and the use of contrast. For instance, uh, in this case, you can see very well the pericalosal arteries and the uh, callosal marginal arteries. And here again, this is a callosal marginal artery which was running through the tumor, which has been just removed. So I'm doing Doppler just to check on the patency of, uh, of the vessel. Elastosonography gives you a, an idea on the consistency uh, of the tissue. If the tissue is hard or soft, as you can see here, you have a, 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 a grade, a refer grade here, a color grade, a scala. And uh, you can see that the tissue is quite hard as compared to the, uh, to the brain. And here is another example, it's the opposite example. This tumor is quite soft as compared to the, um, the brain uh, parenchyma. And in this way, you can better identify the boundaries of the tumor. And for instance, at the end of the resection, you may even identify residual uh, part of the tumor thanks to the difference of uh, inconsistency. Now, uh, you can use the contrast. So with the contrast, you see very well highlighted the tumor. As you can see here, you can see vessels. This is the callosal marginal artery, which was uh, um, running through the tumor. This is the same case that I showed you earlier with the, um, with the Doppler. You can see very well the corpus callosum and the pericallosal artery over here. So you have a, a, a picture of the, not only of the anatomy of the tumor, but also of the vascularization. You can have hints about the histology, for instance. Uh, in gliomas, you can see that uh, the uptake uh, of uh, contrast uh, varies according to the grade of the tumor, uh, with, of course, glioblastoma showing the highest level of uh, um, uh, uptake. And here, this is clinoid meningioma. Look at the polygonos of Willis. You can see it very well. You can see the relationship of the tumor with the vessels. And this is, uh, this is really uh, outstanding. And finally, you may want to check for tumor remnants at the end of the section, as you can see, uh, as you can see here in this picture. So for those of you who are interested, those are some of the articles we have published on this topic. But more importantly, the European Federation of Ultrasound has, uh, in their guidelines, uh, has recommended the use of contrast in neuro-oncological uh, uh, surgical procedure and also in uh, uh, neurovascular uh, uh, procedure. Now, here are some additional tips that you may want to uh, consider throughout your resection. First of all, take advantage of uh, all different modalities. So there is not only a B-mode ultrasound, but you, you can uh, use Doppler, you can use the contrast and uh, so on. And uh, um, additionally, another, another suggestion is a scan at any time and scan several times because this makes you much, much more comfortable with the ongoing of the procedure. And as a matter of fact, you see here, only part of the tumor has been removed. So you, even though if you are at the beginning of the section, you have a, a better idea, a better grasp of how much of the tumor you have removed and how much of the tumor is uh, uh, left over. And of course, at the end of the section, you may want to check for uh, tumor remnants, uh, especially along the walls of the uh, resection cavity. And here we come to one of the drawbacks, for instance. So there are some artifacts sometimes. This are due to um, the differences in the acoustic properties between the liquid and uh, the uh, parenchyma. So 
then there can be some uh, image uh, artifacts uh, you may want to get rid of. And uh, here I give you some tips in order to avoid overdose. First of, first of all, uh, scan always before applying Tabo Tampa. Otherwise, Tabo Tampa will give you a lot of artifacts. Ensure a continuous saline irrigation and fill the resection cavity. Then you may want to scan with a wide linear probe the edges of the resection cavity. And uh, uh, in order to avoid the artifacts that I showed you earlier, you may want to perform a tangential transcortical scan, as you can see here, in order to see the bottom and avoid those uh, artifacts. Another way um, in order to avoid this uh, um, artifact is to scan the bottom of the walls of the resection, as in this case, using a small curve probe, as you can see here. You can see the two ventricles over here, and uh, this is a skull, the arterial skull base. Uh, but uh, I show you again, you see very well the two ventricles, you see the corpus callosum, and here is the uh, bottom of the resection cavity, and there are no uh, artifacts. And uh, additionally, there are also some fluid, acoustic coupling, called acoustic coupling fluid, which are currently under investigation in order to get rid of those artifacts. And finally, and one last application, uh, for instance, this barrel uh, specific probe allows you to follow your uh, catheter when you are, for instance, hitting the ventricle, as you can see here. And here is just uh, the moment in which the catheter is penetrating um, the, uh, the ventricle. So you can use ultrasound as a guidance uh, when you're doing biopsies or when you're placing a catheter into uh, the ventricle. So for a more comprehensive uh, uh, and extensive uh, uh, information about ultrasound, I recommend this uh, uh, publication. Now, there are the uh, other downsides. Uh, I, I, some of them I mentioned earlier. This is an unusual imaging. We are not accustomed to it. Uh, there are difficulties with the orientation. There are artifacts. So this is a very strict operator-dependent technique and needs uh, um, um, specific training for uh, each of us. For, for this reason, we put together a group of experts. Uh, you can see, uh, for instance, Alias Garmo Yaidi, Leolin Padacci, uh, two colleagues from my place, and uh, Germund Ulsgaard, uh, who has been one of the pioneers in the field of uh, intraoperative ultrasound. We have been running courses around the world, as you can see, Mumbai. South Africa, Australia, Hong Kong. Um, we did also a webinar at Harvard and so on. And so many others are on the pipeline right now. And uh, during those courses uh, also, we took advantage of a simulation using a smartphone and a laptop. And I want to show you what we did. Initially, we started with an oscillometer here. And those are all cases that we've been recording. But soon we realized that you, uh, instead of an oscillometer, you can use your smartphone as a mock probe, as you can see here. So you can uh, browse uh, a library of cases that we have been recorded, and you have the possibility to rehearse the intraoperative ultrasound, uh, taking advantage also of the coplanar MR images, as you can see in this uh, uh, video. So, we made a study with uh, several residents. We demonstrated that this method is extremely useful in order to get them learn the uh, semiotic of ultrasound. For these reasons, we made this system available for free over this platform, which is called NeuroStream. And I would like to encourage all of you to uh, log into this uh, platform and try firsthand this uh, intraoperative uh, ultrasound uh, simulation because it's very easy. This is a very seamless uh, and, um, way to get uh, uh, accustomed. This is the platform. It's called the Neurostream Data Academy. Again, I encourage all of you to- uh, Neurostream is an interactive platform where neurosurgeons from around the world can network and keep up to date with technical and technological innovation in their specialty. Neurostream is at the same time a social network, an exclusive clinical cases library, a tool for ultrasound simulation, and a webinar hub. 
Neurostream is a professional social network where neurosurgeons can share their experiences through discussion groups, posts, and video meetings. The platform also offers a multimedia collection of clinical cases encountered by neurosurgeons all over the world. It contains images, videos, 3D reconstructions, and reports. Neurostream provides the opportunity to simulate intraoperative ultrasound. From the comfort of their PC, neurosurgeons can transform their smartphone into an ultrasound transducer and navigate real diagnostic images, training in one of the most advanced imaging guidance techniques in neurosurgery. The platform hosts a series of webinars held by worldwide experts to keep up with the development of the discipline and clinical practice. Bringing all these features together, Neurostream is the perfect place to value and expand the expertise of every member and to learn about innovation powered by medical technology companies. Make the most of it and make your contribution. So I wanted to show you this, uh, this uh, um, video because I think it, especially in this audience, which is probably, as far as I understand, on the opposite side of the world with respect to, to where I am located currently, I think it's uh, very important to to share this knowledge uh, among all uh, the uh, neurosurgical community. So, what uh, keeping going on, I would like to uh, mention some further applications of ultrasound. For instance, uh, we have developed these uh, ultrasound transparent processes. So you, you can see here we had the opportunity to test these on uh, single patients so far, as you can see here. And uh, the images provided that they're quite good. You can see um, the underlying tissue. You can also perform uh, and use uh, contrast. You can uh, do Doppler, for instance. The quality of the images is uh, pretty good. And not only imaging. For instance, you can use uh, what we call focused ultrasound. So focused ultrasound is a non-invasive technique which has uh, several therapeutic potentials for uh, a number of diseases. And we are currently investigating also the, a very uh, wide and large number of uh, uh, diseases which potentially may be treated with uh, ultrasound. Here you can see some of the approved application of uh, ultrasound, for instance, the treatment of potential tremor, Parkinson, neuropathic pain, and there are also some experimental applications such as brain tumor, dystonia, Alzheimer, possibly. And here I show you, uh, for instance, the treatment. Let me go back. You can see the treatment uh, uh, of uh, a patient with, with tremor. And uh, let's see if we start. Here, see, before the treatment, this is the same patient during the treatment. Now, we tested the effectiveness of the treatment uh, immediately in order to uh, further proceed with the heating of the nucleus that we want to um, uh, hit and target in order to uh, correct the tremor. And also in neurosurgical oncology, which is the field uh, in which I am involved mostly, and where you possibly you can use ultrasound uh, exploiting thermal effects using the high frequency ultrasound or mechanical effects using low frequency um, uh, features. And here, for instance, what we do, we open the blood brain barrier using contrast agent, the same contrast agent that, that I showed you earlier. Those are lipidic microspheres, as you can see, lipidic microbubbles that they start resonating once they are hit by the ultrasound and, and resonating, they are capable of uh, um, uh, losing and uh, dis transiently disrupt the tight junction between the endothelial cells, facilitating the extravasation, for instance, of drugs, which otherwise you cannot use. Here's the first patient which has been treated in Europe. Uh, that was back in October. 
um, since then we have been treating six times the, the same patients and the other three uh, patients very successfully. As you can see here, this is before treatment and this is the hours immediately following the treatment. You can see this greed of a contrast uptake, which was not present immediately before, which lasts up to 18 hours. During this window, this is an opportunity window to treat the patient with the uh, drugs, which usually do not cross the blood-brain barrier. And here we come to some of the key points I would like to, uh, for you to retain. Uh, Interoperative ultrasound certainly provides real-time images. This is the only real-time imaging system available so far. And uh, the fusion of neural navigation with intraoperative ultrasound helps in understanding the semiotics of ultrasound. So the fusion also of the same systems uh, may correct the major drawback of the conventional neural navigation, which is the brain shift. Then uh, you need to keep in mind some um, specific echoi characteristics uh, uh, for uh, some anatomical uh, uh, landmarks, for instance, uh, the pineal gland, the, the, um, uh, the choroid plexus, the brain stem, and so on, as I showed you earlier. Then I would like to recommend to exploit all the ultrasound features. So B-mode, but not only B-mode, Doppler, the use of contrast, elastosonography. Those are all additional information which may be of help in resecting tumor, for instance. And when possible, use tricks in order to overcome some of the drawbacks. And here we come to the conclusion of my presentation. Uh, I think that I provided enough information uh, showing that the intraoperative ultrasound imaging is reliable, is accurate, is safe, it's easy to use. It's, uh, you can repeat it as many times as you want during a single procedure, allows for compensation of the brain shift and may, may increase the extent of resection. However, this is a strict operator-dependent technique, requires training, and the learning curve is quite steep. It took me probably up to six years to get to the point I am right now. So maybe the use of ultra-operative simulation, for instance, the device that we, where I showed you earlier, the USIM, may be of help in understanding the ultrasound semiotics of the brain. And the use of uh, ultrasound transparent prosthesis may open a window uh, for patient follow-up. That could change completely the scenario of uh, our neuro-oncological uh, uh, follow-up of patients and maybe even for further treatments, for instance, opening the blood-brain barrier, opening of the blood-brain barrier, which has been demonstrated with the focus ultrasound as a non-invasive technique, which uh, I would like the, uh, to once again underline that uses clean energy and can be applied for multiple therapeutic applications. So, uh, and here I come to the conclusion of my presentation. I would be very happy to take questions. Thank you. Okay, I thank uh, Professor Tim Meko very much for this excellent and very informative uh, presentation. Also with the frontier of the development uh, in application. Uh, I have a little different concept in, in my practice uh, that I use only the ultrasound with no, uh, with no additional navigation because the ultrasound is due to its real time, due to its real time uh, uh, properties, it is a navigation tool itself. And I try to make the operation small uh, cheap and, 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 and simple. Small, cheap and simple. This is very important for the future because one of the major properties of and advantages of ultrasound is the ergonomics. The ergonomics of the ultrasound technique is excellent. It fits perfectly to each other technique as you have perfectly shown uh, Professor, Mas, uh, Professor Meko, and uh, I am very happy that you did this because I guess ultrasound is one of the key techniques for MIN. And also it is the most 
underestimated technique in neurosurgery. And, uh, it has so many other properties, I cannot go into details. I have recently published a volume, a Key Concept in Min. And in this first volume, there are 120 pages uh, for only for the ultrasound. And uh, I, inside there is also a small atlas booklet for the, for the major features of, of anatomy in ultrasound. Moreover, ultrasound provides the user with, uh, with physiology data and pathophysiology data. You see the pathophysiology inside the anatomy. This is, can only be done by ultrasound. And uh, so ultrasound is, is an excellent tool that has been overseen by the neurosurgeons, but the neighbor disciplines, as you have shown very well, has developed this technique excellently and we can now provide uh, from, from their work and we should do it. Uh, if you want to do an extreme minimal invasive technique also regarding the approach, according to the philosophy of Pernetsky, then you need only very small probes, like bur hole probe, for example, or small part probe. Uh, bur hole is eight millimeters, small part is uh, two centimeters. And I invented uh, for the endoscopy, the trans-endoscopic ultrasound. It has only uh, one millimeter in diameter. It's, it works like a brain radar, and you can navigate endoscope by this tool. However, I have learned some additional things by your lecture. It was very informative and very prospective to the future. And I would uh, recommend everybody to learn from you. Thank you very much. May yes. I just uh, uh, add that uh, actually we share exactly the same view because when I'm saying that uh, you need to take advantage of conventional neuronavigation, it's just at the beginning of your experience with ultrasound. That's only in order to understand the semiotic. But right now, I don't use any more neuronavigation yeah. together with ultrasound yeah. anymore. I don't it's, really need it. I just put the problem. I know exactly what I'm seeing. So that's the message. I'm perfectly in agreement with what you said. Mm -hmm. I want to give another advice for the, for the uh, audience. The best training uh, environment to learn ultrasound is to send them to IQ and to train in craniectomy patient. There they can learn best ultrasound, especially if they need to get a feeling for the navigation capacity of this technique. Ultrasound is a navi completely a navigation tool, but you have to learn to compare the image with the anatomical structures of the patient. And therefore, you should train it, as I have shown in my book, you should train as if you would be in the OR. You should go into the IQ and sit behind the patient and look in front of you to the monitor. Then the trainee will get a feeling for the navigation capacity. If he trains in the same conditions like in the OR, he will have this knowledge for the operation. Yes, if you have uh, change it in your mind, you will not be able to do it. So it, it must be simple and it must be into it to use, intuitively to use. You don't have to think. You have intuitively to use it. And another point is, if the surgeon looks on the ultrasound image, he is looking to the image from the perspective of the surgery, which is the, not possible by the radiologist. The radiologist has a mathematical image. But the ultrasound is a biological image through the perspective of the approach 
and from the perspective of the surgeon. And these are the char characteristics we have to, to train the, the youngers. But especially I'm very thankful to you that you make such a good adv uh, advertising for the ultrasound because it is really necessary that we bring ultrasound more to neurosurgery. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. I have one comment if we have yes, time. Yes. So, Professor yes. Dimeko, what's really interesting is, is really, as uh, Klaus mentioned, you are advertising for it and it's very important for neurosurgeon to be very familiar with this. Two points that uh, very nicely you said uh, for like newly grad, because I, it was my personal experience that I got in trouble one time. So for the tumors that we want to ultrasound, we have to use the ultrasound before opening the dura. So because if we are in the wrong space and then uh, we are not, the tumor is a little bit off center, then we figure it out and it's very helpful for us. Instead of opening the dura and then brain starts swelling and then you do ultrasound, you don't find the tumor and you, you get nervous. So I think that's the first point that you mentioned already and it's very important. The second point is, so ultrasound is getting also very popular in uh, pituitary surgery. So especially for a small microadenoma and also personally, I use it a lot for to see the residual of the tumor in supracellular area. Because sometimes, especially as a beginner, it's very hard for us to say uh, how much tumor residual is. You come out of the OR and you, you do the MR, you see, oh, is a lot of tumor there, but you thought you removed everything. So I think ultrasound, they are small probes uh, that now they are coming with uh, BK Medical. So I think that's also a very good thing to use in pituitary surgery. And I think it's getting more popular. Uh, the last thing that I wanted to say, Professor Tura always said, uh, ultrasound is like a car you have to use every day. But intra-op MRI is like an airplane. You use it once, <laughs> once a while. I think that's a very nice uh, explanation of ultrasound. Very nice presentation. Thank you. Can I make a comment if you have time? No problem. Okay, thank you uh, for this wonderful talk, Doctor. Uh, I, I to, uh, to be very open, I'm not a, a regular use a person who regularly use this intraoperative ultrasound, but, but in the recent past, I've started using it. And I would like to share with you one difficult situation I uh, ended up during my surgery. I was uh, trying to biopsy a deep-seated, not really deep-seated, just slightly one to two centimeters too deep to a sulcus, a sulcus in the parietal lobe of a low-grade uh, lesion, low-grade glioma. That was my diagnosis pre-op. And we had uh, intraoperative, we have a navigation machine in our OT and we went there and I was planning to do an open biopsy. When I went there, I was unable to see the lesion and the brain was looking exactly like a normal uh, brain. So I, I was really doubtful. I was just cursing my navigation machine or probably my technique, why this is probably, I'm in the wrong area. I was a little perplexed. Then uh, after uh, struggling for 10, 15 minutes, then I started using, I used my ultrasound machine. And it is not my ultrasound. It was my uh, anesthetist ultrasound machine. And I asked him uh, to put it. And then I saw that the lesion was exactly where the tip of the probe of my navigation machine was. And I took a biopsy just to confirm that I sent it for a, for a frozen section. It came as a positive histopathology. And that's when I realized that ultrasound can help us when we are in trouble, even with neuro navigation. So it's an excellent tool. There is no doubt that it is good in high-grade gliomas, as you've shown, doctor. But in low-grade gliomas, sometimes when, when you want to be doubly sure that you are within the lesion, it is, this is going to be extremely useful. This is an excellent uh, tool uh, for neurosurgeons. Uh, you know, as a matter of fact, if you ask the vast majority of neurosurgeons, they would tell you that at some point in their career, they found themselves in the situation that they got lost inside the brain, maybe looking for a, a cavernous angioma rather than a lesion like a, a glial lesion uh, as happened to you. And at some point, they asked the anesthesiologist, please, you know, may I borrow your uh, ultrasound machine? Unfortunately, I think that uh, the ultrasound is a surgical tool which should become part of our armamentarium on a daily basis, yes. at least for intraparenchymal tumor. This is my strong recommendation. Of course, in order to do so, you need to get acquainted with the, the image and with the semiotic of a uh, of ultrasound. I, I, I now 
uh, I may say that uh, um, for me right now, ultrasound is like the microscope. If I don't have the microscope available, I cannot do surgery. And if I don't have an ultrasound machine available, I cannot do surgery for an intraparenchymal tumor. And I don't do it. It's like, you know, feeling myself naked in the middle of Via Monte Napoleone in Milan, you know, doing shopping in the middle of the place. So, so thank you. May I have a comment? It is very important for the starters to know in neurosurgery, you need a high end machine. Don't try with medium technique. As a neurosurgeon, you have so many preoperative informations already available. If you want to have important additional information like pathophysiological data, you need a high-end machine. And second, always use, as Professor Dimeco said, always use the, the vascular, the, the, the C mode, the color mode. It is very important because the vessels give you additional behavior of your lesion and additional anatomical features. Each tumor and each part of the brain has an own fingerprint, vascular fingerprint, which we have additional to learn because we have forgotten due to the loss of the classical angiography. But the ultrasound can do an angiography. The vessels can be uh, detected until 0.4 millimeters. There are uh, 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 machines that can do that. So use the, the C mode in each case and use only high end machines. Otherwise you will be disappointed. So very quick question for Professor Dimeco. So how is your experience with low grade glioma? Can you see like oligodendroglioma or low, maybe like not oligo because it has calcification you may see, but uh, like low grade glioma, can you see it on ultrasound, especially the residual part? Yes, of course you see it. Uh, there is a uh, hyperechogenic, not at the level of the um, glioblastoma, which is always uh, a little bit more hyperechogenic uh, unless you don't have in the cystical necrotic area which shows uh, hypochogenicity uh, usually. Um, there is also a difference between oligodendroglioma and, uh, um, and diffuse astrocytomas, for instance. Um, in the, um, first of all, in the uptake of the contrast, there is always a very tiny contrast uptake in the oligodendrogliomas, which, you know, is a pandan to the fact that uh, even intraoperatively, you realize that there is a microvascularization which, much, which is much more developed in the oligodendro as compared to the associated tumor. Of course, this hypo, uh, hyper echogenicity um, displayed by the low grade is fading away according to the fact that this is an infiltrating tumor. So you will never see the exact boundaries, you know, uh, of uh, low-grade gliomas with the normal brain parenchyma. Uh, there is a fading hyperechogenicity, and you need to follow this according also to your feelings. So, um, you know, the resistance of the tissue to the visual aspect of the tissue and so on. But uh, for sure, I never rely on the neural navigation, particularly at the end of the resection because everything is, uh, pardon the expression, screwed up for the neural navigation at that point. I think at some point you need to publish the atlas because you have a lot of cases with ultrasound, like how oligo looks in ultrasound, how deep glioblastoma or uh, other, and then all structures. I think that's very interesting thing. Another very important comment. If you buy a new machine, you have to know that half of the intelligence of the technique is in the probe. So you have to discuss with the company which probes you are really need for and for which problem. Otherwise you will buy the wrong probes. And second, you need to be sure that the company have done 
the presets in the machine for neurosurgical probes. Otherwise, you will not have a good imaging. The presets for the neurosurgery must be inside the machine by the company, and you have to ask for this. Yes, thank you. Ben, you want to ask? Ben, please. Uh, yes, uh, hello, Professor and uh, Dimitro, and uh, nice to meet you. I'm uh, Ben, a uh, young neurosurgeon from Hong Kong, and uh, nice to hear your lecture. I like to, li nice to listen to your lectures again. So uh, personally, I find that the ultrasound is very useful uh, in the situation as mentioned by uh, all, of the, all, uh, all of you uh, in the panels. Uh, I also find it very useful in patient of VP shunt. Because the uh, uh, VP shunt, as we all know, is a permanent device and uh, we always uh, want a very good position of the shunt. So I find that the ultrasound is very useful. So one feature is that uh, uh, we could use the probe guide uh, to see the to see the uh, trajectory of your catheter, and you can confirm the catheter tip uh, uh, after you paste the uh, uh, catheter. I find that it's uh, very useful and can ensure good positioning of the uh, repetition uh, beside all of the application that you use. So my question to the panel is that uh, can you share some tips of the uh, uh, the contrast? That you use uh, during the ultrasound for the contrast and hence the uh, ultrasound uh, about the content of the contrast, the timing to give the contrast. And my second question is that I hear that uh, uh, as you mentioned there's some uh, pop for the picture tree surgery. So uh, can you share like the, the company name? And because I was doing the picture tree surgery as well, I find that uh, it, it may be a very good idea to have the picture tree pop. Uh, as well during the surgery. Thank you so much. Okay, I'm not sure I understood correctly everything. So you asked me about the use of contrast and the timing, right? Okay, so in the articles that I mentioned earlier, in, in, if you have a recording of the presentation, you can go back to those. And uh, there are uh, at least two articles where the timing is exactly with all the averages, but in general, it's very quick. So you inject the micro bubble. Usually, we use uh, um, uh, the name of the, of the company is Braco here in Italy, and uh, I don't remember the name. But uh, uh, those micro bubbles, they go into the in the stream uh, in immediately, and in two to three minutes, you start seeing. Uh, highlighting uh, the tumor, which generally lasts, depending upon the kind of tumor you're dealing with, let's say a glioblastoma, approximately three to five minutes, six minutes. And, uh, you know, there is an increasing uptake of the contrast, everything is highlighting and then it's fading away. What you see also gives you some hints about the vascularization of the tumor. You see the feeding arteries, and at some point, you will see also the draining veins, so which is a sort of a calm, right? It's a very interesting because you can understand which one is the vascular hilum of the of the tumor, and perhaps it may help you in you know resecting the tumor because you may want to go, and, you know, as a first thing in proximity and cut all the vascularization of the tumor. So this is approximately the timing. The uptake is extremely uh, rapid in glioblastoma. It's slower in low-grade gliomas because also in low-grade gliomas, you have some uptakes, which varies also with the type of low-grade. For instance, as I said, oligodendroglioma is showing some kind of uptake of contrast which is much slower and less in terms of intensity as compared to the glioblastoma. This is the first question. Then you asked me about the brand of the machine. Is that correct? Yeah, I, I mean the, the pituitary probe that uh, mentioned in the discussion. Mm -hmm. The pituitary probe that we use, uh, that can be used during okay. the transvenoidal surgery. Unfortunately, uh, this was something mentioned by Dr. Klaus. I have no experience with uh, in um, endoscopic uh, approach uh, to the pituitary. 
uh, using ultrasound. So maybe so Dr. Is, can yeah, if you if you want the brand is BK Medical. So they have a small. This is the only company has a small pituitary probe that can it's go so to the nose. That can go to the nose. So, but it's not bendable. This is the only uh, disadvantage it has. Maybe, maybe in the future something bendable comes, then it's much easier. Thank you so much. Takashi Kon, do you have any question, Professor? Uh, thank you. That was an uh, uh, excellent uh, presentation. I'm Dr. Takashi Kon from Tokyo, Japan. And about uh, uh, brain tumor surgery, so we also use ultrasound, but uh, very difficult to identify the border. Uh, uh, except cystic tumor. So um, sometimes the uh, border is not clear. So do you uh, identify to enhance uh, to identify the tumor? Have uh, there is are there any technique to enhance the tumor? Okay, the first technique to enhance the tumor is the use of contrast, that for sure. Then contrast. I show you also the use of, oil, of elastosonography. Elastosonography <laughs> also may be of help. And, you know, at oh, least okay. you have, for instance, some doubts about is this the boundary or is this the other? So you use contrast, then you use, um, uh, what's it called, uh, the elastosonography, and putting together those informations, you have a better grasp of what is the boundary of the, of the tumor itself. Then, uh, oh, okay. as I said earlier, when you are at the end of the resection, unfortunately, there are some artifacts. And so sometimes mm -hmm. it's very difficult to identify the tumor remnant. So again, the use of contrast, for instance, or the use of some tricks, like going, for instance, to obliquely uh, outside the cavity through the parenchyma, scanning the bottom of the cavity. This is a way to get rid of the artifacts. This is one way. Mm. Another way is you take a smaller probe and if the cavity is wide enough, you put the probe right at the bottom of the cavity and then you scan it, putting the probe directly in contact <coughs> with the parenchyma. And this also gets get rid of the, of the artifact. And finally, currently we are under investigation. Uh, we are investigating um, a fluid which is capable to couple the, proper, the acoustic properties of the saline and of the brain. This gets get rid also of the artifacts. Okay, thank you, thank you. But the, the, con the contrast that you inject, is it uh, through the vein? Is, is IV, it in, uh, in, in America, in the US, is called the IV. Finity. IV. Yeah, the IV. Finity. Mm -hmm. IV, IV, of course. IV, IV. IV, IV yeah. And it's immediate. Two minutes, and you get it into the, the brain. Okay. Professor Kimura, are you want to ask any question, Professor? Oh, thank you. Professor Liu. I have, yeah. Mm. I'm here to Kimura. So I have learned a lot from your pretty nice presentation. Thank you for your excellent presentation. I have the same similar question for Professor. Uh, so how do you, uh, yes, how do you, uh, differentiate the uh, isogenic, uh, echogenic tumor and little tumor by using uh, after, after removing a tumor. But you mentioned about using a contrast medium is a good way to differentiate the uh, uh, border margin of the tumor. It's very good uh, concept to use. But uh, I just wanted to ask about the uh, concrete uh, sodium and concrete uh, contrast medium to use. What should you recommend to use to, to clear the there are Martin. Thank you, Professor. I'm sorry, I, I was <laughs> muted. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm, I'm not sure that I, I, I got correctly your question. Could you please um, repeat what you just said? No, no I'm sorry. So that's, uh, I just want about the uh, uh, type, of con uh, type of contrast medium to use for the differentiation between the both tumor margin. The, so oh. especially as I mentioned, so as I mentioned in the to using a contrast medium, uh, uh, enhance 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 the tumor, you use some kind some kind of injection IV. What kind of uh may, what kind of uh, medication as this uh administered to the intravenously? Yeah, thank you. Um, as I said, those are air 
filled micro bubbles. So there are lipidic micro bubbles which contain air. Lipidic and oh, yes. there is only one type, at least in Italy, we can use this. Uh, um, um, uh, Oh, mama, I don't remember the name in this moment, oh. the commercial name. In, in America, is Definity. In other places, is Luminity, mm -hmm. um, the commercial name. It is very popular among cardiologists. Cardiologists, they use it all the time because they use it for, you know, to study the heart yeah. and the big vessels. Yeah, I will ask about to the, my cardiology colleagues. Thank you. I will ask about you. Yes, thank you. Uh, if, if I can ask three quick questions, Professor. Uh, I, I want to find out from you, Professor, uh, which probe is the best? A linear probe, curved probe, and what's the size uh, with the best resolution? My second question, Professor, uh, would you think that the focus ultrasound will replace radio surgery in the future? My third question, Professor, Treating newborn with ultrasound image alone, is it sufficient? Okay, uh, thank you for your questions. Uh, okay, <laughs> the first question was about which probe is the best. Probably there is no best probe. It depends on, uh, you know, in which situation you find yourself. For instance, if you do a parallel procedure, you need the appropriate, dedicated, uh, burr hole uh, probe. Um, basically, if you have a wide region exposed, the dura matter is uh, intact, I find myself more comfortable with the linear, quite wide, 2.5, two, two, 3 centimeters wide linear uh, probe is okay. But for instance, when you are at the end of the section, I really much feel much more comfortable using a small curved probe, which I can put directly in contact with the surface of the resection cavity. So it depends on, uh, you know, in which situation you find yourself. And uh, I think these three kinds of probes uh, and with the addition of the uh, transnasal, which BK has just developed for uh, um, I, you know, the, the pituitary approach, and I have no direct experience with, with that, as I said earlier. I think those four probes, they complete the, the at least for the moment, the right, uh, the appropriate armamentarium of a, um, a neurosurgeon. I don't know if Dr. Kraus agrees with this, but, uh, and, uh, and Amid also. But I think that the, those are the four kind of uh, probes you really need to get. I think uh, this is one question. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. think you're right. There are four types of probe. One of one is the spine probe. Sometimes when the craniotomy is very small, you can even use this uh, perpendicular spine probe. That works also very well. True, but but this is you know just to be a little bit fast. <laughs> so, but it's okay. <laughs> it's something more, you know. So there was another question about um, focus ultrasound replacing radio. Okay, that's a very nice question. You know, focus <laughs> ultrasound is clean energy, and uh, radiation is not so clean. You know, it's a dirty power of some kind. So uh, it might be, it might be in the future. Uh, also, because we are exploring also the possibility to uh, to literally melt the tissue without heating using the focus ultrasound. And maybe we get there at some point. So um, for, you know, for the time being, it's a little bit too early to say something like this and to predict something like this. But certainly, there are a, a lot of uh, potentialities that need to be explored and which is water to explore. My last question, Professor, treating newborn uh, with just ultrasound images. Treating newborn with just ultrasound images. Thank you, Prof. Treating, treating what kind of disease? Treating newborn. Newborn with ultrasound image alone. 
We are CT board. scan or MRI. Yes, new board. A nice uh, minutes with that. Uh, no. No, uh, new newborn, we do ultrasound through the fontanel, make the diagnosis and give the treatment without any other neuroimaging. Is it safe? I have no experience, so cannot comment for this. Yes, Prof. Well, I have experience with newborn, and of course in newborn, especially if they, uh, if the uh, uh, preterm, they uh, don't have much place to work. So you need small probes. The imaging is excellent as the pediatrics will tell you and you can learn from them. This kind of imaging, they use it every day. And uh, I use sometimes only a laser fiber and an ultrasound probe, not more in these cases. The youngest I had was 700 grams for multicystic lesions, for example, multicystic hydrocephalus cases. Thank, thank you, Prof. Thank you to all, all the audiences for a uh, very interactive uh, session. And thank you for Professor Francesco for a very nice talk. Uh, we will hear a concluding remark from Professor Klaus before we move to the next uh, speaker. Professor. Well, I think everything has been said. The only additional information might be that uh, ultrasound, of course, is a perioperative concept. You can use it preoperative during surgery, which was the thematic in the moment, and of course also postoperatively. You can use it everywhere in the hospital. So this is an ex excellent, cheap, mobile and uh, easy tool. It must be learned. And uh, I'm thankful very, very much to Dr. and Professor Di Meco that he introduced us to this wide field, which is mass, most underestimated during modern neurosurgery, which is a great pity for our patients because it is a, a, a smart technique, a intelligent technique. The technique does come to the patient, also to the bedside, and not the other way around. So it is an excellent tool and everybody should learn it in neurosurgery. You have your private radiology radiologist with you when you have an ultrasound machine beside you. Thank you very much, Professor Dimeco. I hope we can keep in contact in the future. I would be interested. Okay. I, I, sent you, I sent you a mail. Okay, thank you very much. I'll be happy to. Thank you. So Thank I, you. I, I must apologize, but I must leave now because I have the operating room, uh, which is getting ready. So I'm, I'm sorry about that. I have to leave you. Yeah, sure, Professor. Thank you very much, Professor. See you Thank again. You. Thank you again. Thank you again. Excellent. Uh, I would like to call upon uh, Professor BJ to introduce our next speaker. Good evening, everybody. Am I audible? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, at the outset, let me thank ACNS for having me as a chair for this uh, yes, talk. Uh, Dr. Rasavi uh, has been uh, given an excellent introduction by Professor Liu. And uh, for those who have uh, joined us late, uh, let me briefly tell upon some of his uh, great achievements. He is uh, currently the head of uh, minimally invasive neurosurgery at Cleveland Clinic, Florida. He has published more than 100 papers and he's a reviewer in many uh, journals. So today's uh, topic is uh, of utmost importance for uh, today's neurosurgical practice because the theme of today's neurosurgical practice is patient safety. We all know that our forefathers uh, used to use very non-invasive and uh, I mean very invasive uh, techniques like uh, ventriculogram, uh, uh, myelogram and angiogram to make diagnosis and fortunately for all of us the current generation neurosurgeons are lucky that we have excellent gadgets available with us uh, to make our life easy and also to reduce morbidity to our patients. So uh, knowing these machines and uh, slowly getting these machines in our operating room is extremely important for us to make uh, the surgery very pleasant and less time consuming and less morbid. 
the, for those of us who do not embrace this this uh, new technology i think we will be pushed back and in the next few minutes i am sure dr raswi who is uh, a, a faculty in one of the top institutions in the us will be able to give us throw some light into the new gadgets that we use how to make our life easy in operating uh, room dr raswi please go ahead thank you thank you so much for introduction bg uh, i share my screen this is really very nice uh, platform I, I, i always enjoy it and then this discussion especially brings always new idea and make us change our practice so uh, my name is hamid borgera zavi so i work at cleveland clinic florida uh, so i think this topic is very important because uh, so when we when the younger generation are very used to technology the older generation anatomy i think we have to combine this that the younger generation knows about anatomy and technology both and I want to sh show you how we can combine these two in our practice. Um, so this is the, our hospital in Florida, is a branch of Cleveland Clinic, uh, Ohio, which is in Florida now. Uh, so Cleveland Clinic, Ohio is a uh, number second hospital in the United States and uh, in the ranking in the board recently. Uh, so I appreciate always my mentors uh, that I learned from them in Cleveland Clinic, Ohio, Dr. Pablo Resinos, Dr. Varun Keshetri, uh, so this is from John Gordon, who says, you are not a true success unless you are helping others to be successful. This was the attitude that always my mentor had, and we pushed us to, to success more and more. Uh, and then I appreciate my partner, Dr. Badi Hadada, who is chairman, and he was al Mehdi fellow uh, 10 or 12 years ago, and he's an excellent surgeon, especially in transcavernous surgery. So I'm always learning from him. Uh, so this is what I got in my graduation, which shows that we are operating on the beach, uh, something like that because of the area that we live. So going from that, when I came to the Cleveland Clinic, I started minimally invasive uh, pituitary and cranial surgery program. The thing that we are highlighted here is a combination of management of malignant tumors, especially deep seated and pituitary tumors, and also other uh, pathologies like facial pain, skull base cancer, intraventricular tumor, meningiomasis. So I'm covering the two first options that I'm uh, showing here. Uh, so the agenda will be a new technology that's getting very popular in US and uh, going also to Canada and Europe now. We call it laser interstitial thermal therapy. Uh, I know in Switzerland, uh, now they are using it. Uh, and I think Professor Bozino of Encantos Hospital has started to use it. And also I want to talk a little bit about endoscopic anatomy and minimally invasive approaches in a skull based tumor and then combine everything to get some new concept. So this laser interstitial thermal therapy, uh, if you see, um, there are a lot of uh, treatment for glioblastoma and deep seated tumor as mentioned, and a lot of tools and instruments like 5LA, interop tumors, optone, interop MRI is up to, but we are still struggling. A clinical trial is getting more and more, um, but still uh, this old, te old technique, which is complete resection plus uh, adjuvant therapy, uh, these both are still gold the standard for the surgery. So this laser is getting very popular. If you see the publication from 1984 to 2000, this was middle of 2019 that I brought this, um, so the publication are getting more and more. Why is getting more? Although the laser was there since 1984 and all we knew, they used it in uterine cancer in 80, even in 80, 50 and uh, a lot of uh, application before, but never used in brain surgery. So the reason is uh, because uh, we have this MRI thermometry now, which help us to quant quantify the heat of the brain with the new technology. It means we know exactly how the temperature is in the brain when we use, all, when we use this laser. So if we go back here, uh, when we hit the brain for this laser, we see central zone, which is like tumor completely gone and peripheral zone, which shows that the tumor gets radiosensitized and chemosensitized. And this is also very important. And also we see a heat sink effect in the normal tissue, even around the, the tumor, even if we don't heat it uh, 
as a goal heat temperature, which we, we will define later. So um, as I mentioned here, why we are getting so, I mean, why the laser is getting more popular now because of three things. First, uh, now the laser is are getting more power. Second, we are getting intra-op monitoring, uh, especially with MRI. And third, the probes are getting much, much more sophisticated. So uh, this is the summary of this laser uh, thermo thermometry that we see under guide of the MRI. We see the yellow line, we see the blue line, and also we see the pixels around. <coughs> so what I will explain this, uh, how it works. So normally this is the laser probe that goes to the brain. If you see this is a robot here, you see my arrow, right? Do you, do you see my arrow? Yes. Okay, perfect. So this is the robot that attached to this laser probe. This laser probe goes to the tumor. Obviously we're using uh, navigation and astrotactic navigation. Two types of laser we have. We have diffuse laser and side fire laser. So I don't want to go to details. These are two companies that produce laser in US. And this is the bolt that goes to the brain and laser go through this bolt. Um, the very important factor here that we do like a pulse laser firing and we are able to monitor the temperature in the brain. So if you see here, we put the laser in the brain and the surgeon sit outside and then monitor the, the temperature and everything based on real time MRI. So this is a video that shows how it works. You see that the probe goes in the brain, in the tumor. And then this is the robot that goes up and down. And this is the tumor that we start heating. So normally we start from the deep part of the tumor and coming superficially to heat the whole tumor and cover the whole area. So especially for deep seated tumor is very useful. As I said, we use a, a very accurate navigation to, uh, to design the probe and trajectory and then use the laser to heat the tumor. The purpose is getting this uh, ablation completely, plus opening the blood-brain barrier around the tumor. Actually, it's very interesting because we were talking about blood-brain barrier in previous um, uh, in previous presentation too. Okay, these are just some details. You register and then you fuse the MRI, uh, then you insert the probe, then then you treat the lesion. Uh, this is also very interesting that uh, we have three zones based off the zone that I showed you before. Uh, the zone one, which is the blue line, is like uh, 10 minutes of 43 degree. It means the dead tissue. Zone two, which is yellow, is uh, intermediate zone. This is the zone that it gets chemosynthesized and radiosynthesized. And zone three is the is the one that we see heat sink effect, and then uh, some antigen opens to the uh, uh, to the lymph nodes, and then it makes them more. Uh, uh, understanding of the tumor from the immune system. So this is an example of the case was a thalamic tumor. This is a little bit um, like the indication, I mean, is not always good to do for thalamic tumor, but sometimes you have radiation necrosis in thalamic tumor and you want to treat it. So this is how the tumor was. Uh, and if you look at, uh, when, I, when I'm talking about deep seated tumors, that is no access. So this is a good example for that. So if we go, we can design the tra tracks and our trajectory based on uh, um, based on arcuate fasciculus corticospinal tract and design our trajectory to the tumor away from these tracks, which I, I think um, now this, D3, this DTI system is not difficult to do. So then uh, when we design the track, we are very careful that our blue line, which is, uh, which is a very heat area, doesn't heat, uh, is corticospinal fi fibers. We can import this data to the to the machine, as you see here. Uh, we can import the data to the machine, and if you see here, white, these are the corticospinal tract that Im we imported to the MRI machine, and we can prevent this yellow line that we see here to hit the corticospinal tract. Uh, so this is also published paper that showed uh, if we don't hit the corticospinal tract with yellow line, which is intermediate zone, so there is less chance of uh, neurological deficit. So Cleveland Clinic is pioneer in uh, this laser interstitial thermal therapy. First, uh, 
trial was done, I think in 2008 at Cleveland Clinic, first clinical trial that was done about laser. And uh, it's very interesting to learn from this experience. Uh, like if you see this, I, I, I'm sure all of you knows about this uh, Kruger effect. At the beginning, when some technology comes, we are very excited about it and everyone is, start using it in everything. Uh, then slowly you get, uh, you get uh, disappointed with this technology. And then when you get more sophisticated, it starts to going up to, to reach out to the uh, plateau, uh, which is like a very sophisticated use of this technology, which we are, I think we are right now about that. So this is the data that we published from Cleveland Clinic Experience from 2011. If you see, uh, we did, I mean, the, the, the hospital did a lot of even low grade glioma, uh, metastasis, high-grade glioma, but uh, slowly you see the indication shifted from low-grade glioma to just uh, uh, radiation necrosis, which is like a blue line, and also high-grade glioma, especially uh, deep-seated high-grade glioma. So I'm just saying uh, the indication that changed, this is exactly this Kruger effect. At the beginning, everyone was excited. They thought, okay, we don't need any craniotomy anymore. Let's do for all tumors. But uh, slowly you, you learn the indication. For now, the best options are radiation necrosis and deep-seated glioma for laser, especially the small ones. So this is the multicenter study published about radiation necrosis, which shows much better effect than Avastin and other medication and steroids, obviously. You can get rid of steroids very quick with radiation necrosis when you do laser for them. So these are some studies. I don't want to go to the details, but uh, as we mentioned, uh, hyperthermic laser ablation in rats, there is a study that shows it increased uh, the blood-brain barrier transparency. And if you see also, even for radiation, it's increased the sensitization to the radiation which is very good for um, glioblastoma patients. So uh, I skipped this one. This is the last paper published uh, last year about uh, uh, increasing blood brain barrier in laser interstitial thermal therapy. And if you compare this after laser, you see the perme permeability that was uh, the transmission that was uh, uh, measured with electron microscopy increased after laser interstitial therapy uh, in, the, in different groups of the rats. So uh, these are also the paper we published about some thalamic tumors that we did. These are some examples. Of, obviously, there are, these are very successful examples. We, have, we had also complication about uh, one or two complications in 14 patients. But if you see this glioblastoma is slowly in three months, this is right away after, the, uh, the number B is right away after, um, laser, which is like a cavity. It, it turns to be a cavity. And obviously, the blood-brain barrier opens here. And it slowly shrink. Obviously, meanwhile, you start to give chemotherapy and radiation. So I think in the future practice, the key will be do this laser and then start the chemo and radiation right away. Because the incision are very small. It's like one centimeter incision. You can do start the chemotherapy like two, three days after. The blood-brain barriers are open, and then the chemotherapy effect will be much better. So this is another example of glioblastoma in few few months. And this is my, in my practice, this is a radiation necrosis. You see this patient, instead of going to Avastin medication, corticosteroid therapy, long term, I did the laser. And if you look at the edema in four months, how much is decreased and the patient's symptoms, which was severe headache, completely improved. Two weeks after surgery, I stopped the steroids. So I think is this is how we use this minimally invasive approach to the, for this patient to, um, to prevent them to suffer from um, um, long-time corticosteroid and other medication. This is another case in my practice. This was actually close to motor area, in pre-motor area, and the in four months, the radiation, uh, the amount of edema significantly decreased. So if maybe uh, the future of glioblastoma surgery might be laser plus, I mean, at least for deep-seated glioma, laser plus uh, starting a chemo radiation uh, very fast. So we don't use it for meds because gamma knife is obviously more useful than laser, but for, for other uh, options, especially radiation necrosis, because we have already prospective clinical trial is very useful. There are multiple clinical trials about glioblastoma is still uh, in progress, but there are multiple uh, prospective studies that showed laser itself, even in huge glioblastoma, is better than biopsy itself. So 
the message from this uh, this part of presentation is uh, uh, if you get near total coverage of high grade glioma is like a resection because you will you will have cyto reduction then it's better than biopsy itself so uh, this is the concept of opening blood brain barrier that also discussed in uh, uh, in the other introduction, uh, in the other presentation about focus ultrasound, we are also believing in opening blood brain barrier, especially with the rats model that already came. And I think combination of the, these two hopefully helps with especially recurrent and deep seated glioblastoma. With radiation necrosis, it definitely works and is very useful. So I think I have still some time to show some endoscopy concept too, right? So I think I have some time to show some endoscopy too, right? Yes, please. Okay, perfect. So uh, as we mentioned, uh, when we go to pituitary tumors, I, I want just to combine this uh, uh, this concept of technology that we use for deep seated to the to the to the definition of endoscopy that we also use for deep seated tumor from the other side with better visualization and also anatomical knowledge. So I all we all we all know endoscopy. If you don't if you use microscope for pituitary surgery, it's like seeing eyeball like this. But if you use endoscopy, then uh, it's like this, going really there and then watch it. So this is the concept of endoscopy that all uh, we, all, we all know. But uh, these are the tools that we use. Obviously, everyone is familiar with this. This is how we work our endoscopic uh, room is. So we have two monitors, uh, navigation, endo camera. So, uh, and we have two monitors, obviously, because the surgeon looks at one monitor and assistant look at the other monitor. This is the reason that the assistant doesn't, the surgeon or assistant doesn't bend the head to the side to get tired after a few hours. So we have like parallel looking, looking in different sides and both are very comfortable standing hours there. So I want to show you an example how the knowledge of anatomy helps, um, helps our outcomes. So this was the, 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 the paper that I published with my mentor, Dr. Miranda in Pittsburgh. So we were working on uh, anatomy of the superior hypophysial artery, and then we highlighted it. Uh, so we, we saw multiple branches of superior hypophysial artery, one artery going to optic nerve, obviously, which is very critical to preserve it. The other artery goes to the infendibulum, and we describe it. So uh, when we describe it, how we use it for a practice of the endoscopy and uh, like craniopharyngioma resection. This was an example I want to highlight. So this is a patient with a uh, pre-infendibulum craniopharyngioma. So when we go to the surgery, if you look at the left side is my dissection in the lab. So you see the branches of superior hypophysial artery. And with this knowledge, I go to operate this craniopharyngioma. And if you see exactly, I see this, uh, the branch of superior hypophysial artery going to the uh, to the optic nerve. And I know that I have to preserve it because it doesn't have that much collateral. So if I hit this artery, then the optic, uh, the vision of the patient will be in danger. So this is the, an example of how anatomy beside the technology can help us. It's not always technology. So another example is in Cushing patient that is getting uh, very, very popular now is the, about the medial wall invasion in fun functional adenoma. So if you look at this picture, uh, you see on the, on the left side that there are some attachment of the, uh, of the tumor, the Cushing tumor to the medial wall of the cavernous sinus. So I want to show you during the surgery. So we published a paper about how key sequence is useful in, uh, in diagnosis and in uh, in the prognosis of the invasion to the medial wall of the cavernous sinus. This is the key sequence that we see uh, attachment and some invasion of the uh, uh, functional tumor to the cavernous. So this is how anatomy helps us. This is a paper published from Pittsburgh group about uh, ligaments of the pituit ligaments that attaching from the clinoid um, to the uh, uh, layer of the pituitary gland. So if we know this ligament and the concept of the medial wall of the cavernous sinus, I think this is also an anatomy dissection from our lab. If we know about this ligament and, and the medial wall of the cavernous sinus in pituitary surgery, then we can use this concept uh, 
uh, for better outcomes of our patient. If you see, this was a pushing patient that I, I, I did in my fellowship with Dr. Kashetri. So, uh, so in this patient, we know that the medial wall of the cavernous sinus invaded on the uh, left side of the patient, which is right screen. So now I want to show you uh, how resection helps with the uh, uh, with the patient outcome. Obviously, because we have the knowledge of anatomy of medial wall and the ligaments that they are uh, using in the, they, they are uh, between the medial wall and the uh, lateral of the carotid. Then we know there are there's some invasion there from the imaging. Then we go and chase, chase the medial wall. So this is how we detach the medial wall. And these are the ligaments that we know now based on the anatomy, the knowledge, and we are starting the separate, separating it. And uh, this is separating the medial wall from, uh, from the ligaments and from the carotid artery. And uh, this, is an, this is another ligament that we know now based on, the, on our anatomy knowledge that there are ligaments there that attaching the medial wall uh, to the carotid artery and clinoid. So we start detaching it and removing it. Why we do that? Because we saw in the imaging, this was invasion there. We send it to pathology after resection and it was positive for tumor. This patient went completely to remission and this is uh, how we remove, um, we remove the medial wall of the cavernous sinus completely. Um, so just wait to finish this video. Yeah, so this is medial wall, we send it to the lab and it was positive for tumor. Obviously, uh, if it's not really invaded like the other side, we can coagulate uh, the wall instead of re resection. And with coagulation also, you can get go to the remission if the, uh, the wall is not completely uh, crossed through. Uh, so the other concept that help us in the, I want to show how anatomy help us in, uh, in doing surgery is this other paper that we published about inferior hypophyseal artery. So we, we did an anatomical study. We saw that this uh, uh, inferior hypophyseal artery uh, in opposite of superior hypophyseal artery that doesn't have that much uh, anastomosis. It has a lot of anastomosis and then you can coagulate it by lateral and it doesn't really change the outcome of the patient, especially in pituitary function. So um, this is another example how the anatomy knowledge can help us. So if you want to remove the posterior clinoid and go to the perpendicular uh, perpendicular area for chordoma or for meningioma, then this anatomy concept will help you to know that this function really is not, uh, uh, will not be uh, sacrificed by uh, removing this artery. Uh, so I wanted to show this. Uh, this is also courtesy of my uh, mentor, Pablo Resinos. So the last thing that I want to show really how endoscopy, endonasal, the anatomy knowledge and the concept of the technology change our practice in uh, approaching endos endoscopic to like giant pituitary adenoma. This is an example um, of the very giant pituitary adenoma that uh, we did uh, during my fellowship. So. Uh, you see how high is the tumor. Uh, so now with the, with the new knowledge of anatomy and technology and then you, getting more used to endoscope, we know that we can remove the whole thing here. So this is um, the anatomy paper. This is the route that we are going to this tumor. These are from our labs, the picture. So this is how we um, uh, start with the cella, use the navigation. This is again, highlighting the technology, using the navigation both sides, using Doppler ultrasound both sides to make sure the carotid is far away, uh, opening the dura. Uh, obviously the intracellular part is the easy part. Uh, so when we remove the intracellular part, then we, we start to remove the supracellular part. Uh, this is a retrochasmatic space, there's some cella there. Uh, and then obviously meanwhile we use navigation, uh, so you see always navigation, multiple use of navigation to make sure we are in the right direction. So we remove the tumor. This is a 30 degree to the anterior to help us uh, see the tumor better. Yeah, this is the part of the tumor that we can also use ultrasound to see how much tumor is residual. So 
this is the tumor that is coming out and mm, uh, you see through the very small area of the opening, you, you are able to get the whole tumor. So uh, yeah, this is the supracellular piece of the tumor after cleaning. So you see the hypothalamus at the end and uh, thalamus, mass intermedia and fornix and obviously foramen of Monroy. So you see in this, we have anatomy knowledge plus using microscope, using endoscope, using ultrasound, uh, and using navigation. So these are the titanium clips that we use in the diaphragm cellar to prevent the leak, and then we use the nasal septal flap. Uh, so this is also a new concept to use these uh, clips for uh, diaphragm cell. Uh, okay, so these are this was an example of using technology, anatomy knowledge, instruments all together to have a successful surgery. Many years ago, the surgeon used to remove these tumors uh, a little bit cellular and then go back to the transcranial route to remove the rest or wait for the tumor to come down. But this is a new concept. So last thing that I want to show is about supraorbital because I know Klaus is very experienced in that. Uh, so again, I want to show how anatomy help us for decision making. So we did an anatomy study about um, uh, the, supra, uh, the superior orbital, uh, supraorbital approach. So this is the area that we really can see with microscope, not endoscope. This is a very uh, defined area that we found in, ana in anatomy that we can see and expose with the, uh, with the microscopic surgery in supraorbital approach. So this was a case example. Then based on this anatomy knowledge that I had, then I decided for this patient to go supraorbital. So this is how it works. In this case, we use also endoscope. Uh, this is the uh, pneumatic arm that we use to hold the endoscope. You see the size of craniotomy is even smaller than the tumor itself. So uh, yeah, I want just to show this video. This is the post-op oh, video and uh, <laughs> just the post -up picture. And I want just to show you a video uh, of this patient and then that will be all for today. This was with also my mentor, Dr. Racinos in Cleveland Clinic, Ohio. So this is how we uh, position the patient. Obviously we, don't, we are very careful with frontal branch. Uh, of the facial nerve, frontotemporal branch. So first relaxation of the brain, obviously and getting CSF and then uh, going to the base of the tumor. I just skipped this area. So removing the tumor base. Uh, so detaching the tumor now from the brain from the cortical area. These are all from supraorbital area. Uh, so trying to detach the tumor. I go forward a little bit, yeah. So remove the tumor from the cortex. Yeah, dissecting the artery. And then finally, yeah, so this tumor then finally comes from the small, the small area. Uh, and then this is also detaching the last part and dissecting the last part. Finally, we see the optic nerve, uh, right optic nerve that was close to the tumor. So the thing that I was to highlight is this point. Uh, if you look at here, so obviously the tumor removed, but we have minimal uh, retraction effect in the diffusion. I always look at diffusion after my cases to see how much retraction I had on my patient. So this is really no retraction on the brain, although the, the, uh, the, the, the craniotomy is really a, a small, but it shows that I didn't struggle because I, I drained the CSF. I, 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 I knew about from, from the beginning, is the tumor is appropriate for supraorbital, uh, is it in the area that we, I can reach and positioning of the patient using navigation combination of all of this. So I think, uh, so I forget, I think if I have time, I can show this one too. Uh, how much time we have? You may show prof. Five, five minutes. Sure, sure prof. Okay. 
So I think this anatomy knowledge also helped me to understand where is a tumor in tuberculum cell. A small tumor is a good indication for transesphenoidal instead of going supraorbital. So again, I want to show you this case, and this is the last one. Uh, so this was a tuberculum cell also with my mentor that we operated in Ohio. So uh, obviously using navigation, using Doppler, uh, removing planomets venoidale, uh, expose the uh, um, superior part of the optic nerve, opening the dura in the middle, and this is a very nice approach for a small meningiomas because you coagulate the base of the tumor first. You reach it, reach to the base of the tumor. So opening the dura and then uh, removing the tumor from the optic nerve, which is here. So this is exactly the micro microsurgical technique that we are using in endoscopy. So we are actually bringing the microsurgical dissection, dissection technique to the endoscopy. So, and this is the tumor removal that comes. Uh, uh, so after dissection, the tumor comes from the, uh, the nose and, uh, and then finally we can see the A1 anterior communicating artery, uh, optic nerve completely intact, cause um, A2 bilateral. Okay, so uh, the last thing that I want to show is, uh, this concept of uh, real-time uh, uh, ICG technique that uh, is now available. So if you see, we can see the carotid arteries in this case, the, yellow, the green that we can see all carotid arteries very nicely. So this is also another example of how technology help us to have a safer, obviously with anatomy knowledge, we know where the carotid is, but this is the real-time uh, ICG that we can see where the carotids are. So. Uh, just fi finally, this is some project that we have in the lab. I want just to show the anatomy is still going. It's not that we know everything about the anatomy. We, ha we have to do more and more. This is some projects in our lab. We, are, we look at the blood supply of the cavernous sinus recently and we published it. So finally, uh, the final word is uh, that uh, new technology, anatomy knowledge, obviously from practicing in the lab, uh, multidisciplinary approach, for example, for endoscopy, uh, like combination of ENT neurosurgery uh, and new surgical techniques uh, uh, and also minimally invasive approaches um, is very helpful to have a better outcome, but also very important uh, that we select the right patient for the right approach. I think finally we will know after a few years of practice, this is the most important thing rather than technical um, technical expertise or using technology. So this is our course will be in December in Florida. I don't know if anyone is interested. We have a hands-on course, uh, course three days in Cleveland Clinic, Florida. At that point uh, in December, it's very warm and nice here. So please join us if you have time. And uh, I appreciate your time. Uh, and that's all. Thank, Thank you, uh, Dr. Rasvi. Uh, wonderful uh, presentation. Uh, wonderful, de de wonderful delivery of a new uh, the concept, a very important concept in today's practice, uh, using uh, technology and also the use of anatomy, uh, the, the basic anatomy to uh, do safe uh, neurosurgery. Uh, it is really nice to see Dr. Rasinos and uh, Varun Shetri because uh, they were there in the department when I did my uh, oncology fellowship at Cleveland. Oh, Cleveland. nice, nice. Yeah, I, I was there with Dr. Barnett, uh, Dr. Angelo, Dr. Vogelbaum, and oh, later on, I spent one year with uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Andre for uh, the functional uh, oh, neurosurgery nice, nice, fellowship. So uh, nice, to, it was nice. really exciting. It was really nostalgic to see the people and your videos and uh, all those. Things. Exactly. Anyway, coming to the coming to the topic. Now the topic is open for a discussion and at the end of it, I have a couple of questions, but let me respect the uh, audience here and then uh, I'll uh, come back to my question. The uh, topic is open for discussion. Any questions? Professor Pasif, Takashi Kwon. Yeah, uh, thank you uh, for the very informative lecture. Um, I, I'm very interested in late, uh, laser interstitial hypothermia because I have a basic uh, exp uh, experiment in Duke University uh, uh, 
uh, hyperthermia about the uh, malignant brain tumors. So uh, that was very promising. And uh, in what aspect the size of the tumor and the uh, malignancy of the tumor, is it effective for our the, uh, grade four GBM? Uh, for the larger size, uh, uh, what extent? Uh, until, to, to what extent? So that's, uh, the that's size really, of the... yeah, it is, it's a very good question. I think obviously when the tumor is accessible and resectable, we prefer to resect it because we want to re reduce the mass effect. Uh, but if the tumor is really not uh, resectable, for, for example, so it's very questionable, but there are some small butterfly glioblastoma that you don't want to go and resect it. So you can do bilateral trajectories, one trajectory here, one other, and they burn everything, and then they start the chemotherapy right away. Obviously, it's not clinical trials about it. There, there are a lot of clinical trials now going on, but there are data that shows it's better than biopsy itself for even butterfly glioblastoma. But I okay. think the most useful part is they are a small glioblastoma. You, you, do a, you do a glioblastoma surgery in one and a half year, you see a small, a small nodule comes back, and then the hmm. patient doesn't want another surgery, you just do a small trajectory, you burn it, and then you can restart the chemotherapy. Uh, hmm. So I think the most important indication for glioblastoma is deep-seated, uh, non-accessible, plus the one that they are like butterfly and you don't want to go and then resect everything with complications. And so the patient goes home next day and we can start the chemotherapy very early. Thank but you. as I mentioned yeah. about radiation necrosis, they are prospective clinical trials and very, very useful. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Any more questions? Yeah, I have one question, Professor. Uh, we use as a I think you get disconnected. Uh, till uh, Liu comes and can I uh, go ahead with my questions? Hmm. Yeah. yeah, I think Liu is disconnected. Maybe yeah, we, okay. Uh, let me other questions first. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Ben, would you want to ask some questions? Uh, yes. And uh, I saw you have experience in uh, uh, the endoscopic uh, scalp uh, surgery. So my uh, question is that uh, uh, how anterior is your extent uh, in deciding the, uh, for choosing the endoscopic approach? For example, uh, sometimes for uh, olfactory, uh, olfactory growth and meningioma, uh, for uh, those uh, small ones, you could also consider using the endoscopic approach. Mm -hmm. So how anterior uh, would you uh, define your the limit of uh, repair? Uh, uh, during your surgery. Another question is uh, about the any experience in using the ICG in, uh, in your endoscopic uh, surgery. Yeah. Exactly. So uh, I think for the first question, I think when the endoscope came many years ago, everyone was very very excited about it. Same the Kruger effect uh, that I that, that I explained in my presentation. E e they said no craniotomy, everything through the endoscope. But now the concept is very reasonable constant. So I think for my personal my personal experience for big uh, olfactory group meningioma, I, I, I prefer craniotomy because it's very destructive to go through the nose. If I if if the patient if I am the patient, I prefer to do craniotomy because you 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 this this is also craniotomy. You go through the nose, you do craniotomy, but you don't see it. You destroy the whole bone. Uh, so I think my personal. Um, opinion for olfactory group meningioma really uh, I prefer to do uh, transcranial especially now with this uh, small approaches you can do a small perianal craniotomy subfrontal and you can get the whole tumor through it. so about the uh, 
and I for tuberculum, a small tuberculum be, be, uh, between carotid arteries, I think it's amazing to do um, uh, to do transnasal because it's less destructive. You don't go too much anterior to to remove all ethmoid cells. Uh, so about the ICG, I think ICG is very useful for location of the carotid, not necessary really always, but for flap, I think the Pittsburgh group is using for, uh, frequently to see if the flap is viable. It's very useful for the flap to see if your flap is functional. If your flap is not shining in the ICG, then you can use other options if you have a big posterior fossa CSFU. Yes, and uh, thank you. And uh, another uh, question is that, uh, when you uh, transpose your pituitary gland, then would you uh, drill the posterior canal first uh, to uh, increase uh, your uh, freedom? Uh, so what, what, what was the question for posterior gland you asked? Yes, uh, when you transpose your pituitary gland, uh -huh. so uh, would you drill the posterior canal first? Oh uh, yeah, exactly. So I, I personally don't have that much experience in removing the posterior Clinoid because I think that's really level level five. Um, but uh, the thing that I I saw when you transpose, then you coagulate the inferior hypophyseal artery. This was the study that we did. We removed bilateral. I mean, we we went through all Pittsburgh experience in inferior hypophyseal artery bilateral, and we saw few patients got uh, uh, diabetes insipidus temporarily, but pe none of them had permanent diabetes insipidus. Then we said, okay, it's very safe to get the inferior hypophyseal artery, even bilateral. So inferior hypophyseal artery, if you don't get it, then you, if it evolves, then it will be really painful during the surgery because it bleeds all the time. And it can be also very dangerous bleeding. You, you will mix, you will confuse you with the carotid artery injury sometimes because it's a real artery and it bleeds a lot. So you coagulate it and then you remove the posterior clinoid and then you have the you have the interpeduncular space open for you, especially for cordoma and then big meningioma that goes to that area. Yes, thank you so much. Yes, a really quick lecture. Sure, sure, sure. Thank you. Dr. Kimura, would you want to ask some questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again for calling me. So, uh, thank you. Excellent lecture and wonderful presentation. I learned a lot, of Professor. Uh, Professor. Hamid and uh, so my my great concern about the uh, skull base uh, surgery for the endoscopy assisted skull base surgery. So you performed the uh, just a transcranial endoscope assisted uh, tumor removal for the tuberculum the meningioma, as we mentioned in the olfactory group meningioma. So, but I still are worrying about uh, just using just only an endoscope assisted, not microscope, just using the endoscope. You too much. I understand. Is, there may yeah. be some technical limitation, and uh, you do you use some special instrument for the endoscope, thing, endoscope alone surgery? Thank you. So, so you are talking about transcranial endoscope yeah. use, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think that's a very nice question. So the the arm that we are using now, so this pneumatic arm uh, and sometimes electric arm, I think is very useful to hold the endoscope. The move, when you move the endoscope, the movements are not very, very sharp, very, very extensive movements. You can you can push the bottom. Actually, these are these are electric arm. You can push the bottom and remove the endoscope a little bit. I think endoscope holder is the most important thing. The second thing is obviously we are we, we need a still to to uh, to develop the instruments, but the in instruments that we use in endoscopic surgery is very useful in that, especially lung bipolars if you need. Or, uh, or like uh, some lung, lung instruments that we use for your endoscopy, I think is very useful. So the advantage obviously is uh, that you can see, uh, like we, you can use 30 degree scope to look around. So okay. the other thing that is very getting very popular, I'm sure you know about that is exoscope, which does the same oh. thing. Obviously it doesn't go in really like endoscope, but it's the same concept. Instead of uh, changing your position all the time, you just change the exoscope position. I think the future, the, in the future, the exoscope will be really popular instead of using endoscope. I think endoscope was getting popular a little bit in transcranial surgery on the, until the exoscope came. Then when the exoscope came, then the concept shifted to, endo, to, to exoscope instead of the endoscope. So, you so mean there, when you are comfortable yeah. with doing endoscopic surgery, you will be very comfortable with exoscope. 
Yeah, I, I just uh, I, I I I think that's it. I think that's good. We just use the just endoscope X scope simultaneously exactly. use for under the endoscopic assisting. Yeah, exactly. That's the right concept too. Yes. I'll, yeah. Thank you for your uh, comment. Thank you. Yeah. It's just very yeah. expensive now. Yeah. Uh, expensive. Yeah. We use uh, all by in my university hospital. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. All by yeah, all by very nice. And to you to use uh, and uh, simultaneous use and and as endoscope, very nice. Exactly. Yeah. I think it's a synoptive too. It's a synoptive uh, company too. And also the Zeiss Convivo, you can also close the arms and use it as an exoscope. I think that's yeah. probably the most uh, financially is the best thing to buy because you can use it as an endoscope and also use it as an exoscope. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Actually, I I agree with you. Thank you. Yeah. Dr. Korn, Dr. Korn, uh, will you please come forward with some questions for us? I think uh, he's. Uh, yeah, I already asked uh, some of the uh, lasers. So, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, it's okay. So, uh, I have, yeah, because. Uh, uh, I asked uh, several questions, very interesting, the laser in it. I have read several papers, several reports, and uh, um, if the, it's Africa in all over the world, so I'm very, really interested, really uh, eager to try, uh, even in Japan. So um, I expect the future uh, progress of the research. Exactly. The only thing that I want to tell you is not really in, in necessary to have intra-op MRI. You can, you can put the bolt in the OR with trajectory and then bring the patient down to the MRI machine. So no, mm -hmm. normally you need, you need just to attach the monitor and the system to the MRI machine. Uh, so mm -hmm. which is, doesn't really cost that much. And then you can bring the patient down, do the laser there and then bring back to the OR. So obviously it's mm -hmm. better. I'm not sure even it's like completely better to have intra-op MRI because the same time consuming so the time is almost the same to go to the MRI machine rather than being, bring the patient down to the MRI, especially when you have an MRI in like it's close to the elevator. So oh, okay. that's why I to tell you it's not mm. really necessary to have intra of MRI. You can do it even without having intra of MRI. Dr. Klaus. Okay, thank you. Well, a very nice lecture, very complex, many topics, and it is so far difficult to answer all to this, uh, to make a comment on all these topics. But I take one, one feature. It's anatomy. You were talking about anatomy. And the main problem in anatomy is why do neurosurgeons uh, get lost in the brain? How can this occur even if they know very nicely the anatomy? How does this occur? And the reason is that we have to do a, another kind of anatomy. We have to make uh, the anatomy to a key concept of minimal invasive neurosurgery. And therefore, you have to change the anatomy. The anatomy a surgeon needs intraoperatively is a simulation anatomy. So the anatomy should be trained in the laboratory like a simulation of an operation. This makes the surgeon competent, this kind of anatomy. He can directly take with him into the operation room and it will, will help him to guide. The hot spot, the, 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 blind, the blind spot on this topic is the brain of the surgeon, not the brain of the patient. Neurosurgeons will have to learn in future what does my brain need that I can make a good procedure in the brain of the patient. This will be the question. And therefore it is very important that you train the things according to the abilities and the needs of your own brain. I call this the neuropsychology of the neurosurgeon. This will be a major topic in the future. It's, it's, it is a part of ergonomics in neurosurgery. I can only uh, draw your attention on this topic because it, this will decide that the, the, the transfacial uh, and transnasal technique is not major. 
it is only uh, good for very experienced, very well trained neurosurgeons. Uh, there is a lot more to say, but it is not a time now. It's too complex. Thank you very much. It was, however, a fantastic presentation, and I myself learned a lot of things by myself also. So, so it's very interesting that you are talking about this anatomy. This is exactly the concept when I did my fellowship in neuroanatomy in Pittsburgh. Actually, I was thinking about exactly the same thing. I think it's not the time to, I, I think it's not really, it's useful, the old fashioned anatomy, but I think it's now, now we have to put ourselves in the surgical position and learn anatomy. You are, I, I hundred, like hundred percent agree with you. So cut the cut the brain and see the structures in a very nice way. It doesn't help. I mean, there are atlas that you can see, it, but yes. you can. So I remember when in, in Pittsburgh when I was research fellow, I put the head exactly in the position of the patient. So uh, and then I try to see. Okay, even if I I have to retract from what area I have to retract, then what I can expose. And this was a concept that we did in this supraorbital paper. So we put the patient exactly in that position and then see, okay, with just microscope, how, how much we can see. So yes. you're absolutely right. I think the future of the anatomy will be surgical oriented anatomy. Yes. So, so Klaus, I want to ask you a question. So I think you, you learned supraorbital from Dr. Pernetsky, right? Yes, yes. So, so how, he was a very pioneer in this. So, how, how this concept came to his mind? Uh, so probably you were with him in the whole process, right? Yes. I think this, uh, the reason always was that he was somebody who was always eager, eager to preserve the function and to uh, not to disturb the, the, the patient too much. Yes, the normal function of the patient. He was only looking, looking to be atraumatic. At his time, this seemed to be an anatomical problem. Therefore, therefore, he was more talking about approaches and he called it keyhole concept. I have advanced this concept in my uh, recent publication, Key Concept in MIM to uh, the concept of uh, the uh, min key concept. That means we do not ask anymore for the whole, rather than to ask for the key. What are the keys, technical and conceptual, for min in future? This is the new concept. And you can read it and also all the conceptual things, things I was talking about in keyhole concept in min two volumes and it will become seven volumes when when finished uh, you can read there this kind of concept which i have learned by panetsky of course i had to advance standing on his shoulders i can look further and, but i have to decide the direction to which i look yes so thank you for your question and thank you for mentioning panetsky we should not forget him no, 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 exactly. Because unfortunately, he died in a very young age that he was like going to be very successful. Yes, I think yes. that Dr. Reich, uh, you, you work with Dr. Reich too? Who yes, of course. He, he, started uh, in, he started in my laboratory. Uh, very interesting. So Dr. Pernesky, when he started... I had, a, I had a laboratory. So when he started supraorbital, did he use retractor at the beginning? Or, or at that point, he had the concept of CSF drainage and... Uh, everything Do you remember no no that? He, he he started he he went on they learned it from the beginning to use this technique hmm. so it means he went yeah, just to the just state. no did we do this. we opened the cisterns oh okay so it was not like do you use do you use no do you use uh, mouth tracking microsurgery, mouth tracking microscope? Uh, no, we don't. We have it, but we don't use. Okay. This is a very important concept. We cannot talk now, exactly. but you will find it in the book. Why it's so important. Yeah. No, I, I have seen people use it, but we, we don't. I don't use the mouth feed. Yes, I understand. You can do much more if you use it. You can 
make microsurgery through the borehole if you use a mouth tracking otherwise you cannot do it because you can move all the time right is no because you can if you zoom up so that your borehole is the whole visual field then you will lose depth uh, accuracy in the depth only one millimeter therefore you always have to change the focus plane and this must be online and that cannot be done by hand you have to move with your mouth tracking the focus line along with the tip of the instruments I have described it in this book I learned I learned it from Yashakil Nice, nice. Because my mentor, my mentor also, my 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 partner was also Yasha Gilfellow, Dr. Adada. So I learned a lot from him. Especially, the, it's interesting that the suction also he used is exactly. It's Yasha a pity. Gilfellow. It's a pity that we forgot the mouthpiece because once you operate with the mouthpiece, with the mouth uh, switch, you will work in a different world, mm. completely different world regarding ergonomics i describe it in the first volume of this series key okay. concepts in min and I, I how to it. how to use it how to use it and how to adapt it to your face the mouth the mouth switch so, so your, your where is your where is your practice now is it in germany or switzerland in mexico <laughs> oh really in guadalajara Oh, yes, nice. yes, yes. I have my professorship in Guadalajara and I trained a lot of Latin America people. Very interesting. In the so last 20 from, years. So you moved from Greifswald to Mexico? No, no. Later, later. I, later. I was in, in other uh, departments also. In Munich, I was subdirector and then I went to, to Mexico. Oh, very nice. Very nice. Okay, just one, just was curious. Okay, BG, sorry, so sorry for uh, no problem, no problem. It was it was really interesting to see to listen to uh, uh, giants in our field like Dr. Claus coming up with wonderful ideas, things which we have I've exactly. never heard of. Those concepts me. are really yeah, I, I I've never heard of it. Thank we are really lucky to have you, Dr. Claus, in this uh, meeting. Uh, yeah, Thank anyone you else? Much. Yeah, Dr. Harshad, uh, do you want to ask some questions, Harshad? I'll ask some of uh, the, some questions that I have regarding autolit. Uh, I was there with uh, Dr. Barnett between 2012 and 13 when uh, they were, I mean, they had already published their paper on this with, uh, they, they had a combined study with UH, if I, uh, if I remember right. And then they were start, uh, using it. And at that time, uh, Mohammadi was also there. And I remember, uh, uh, doctor, I was uh, I was his assistant for one of the cases in a posterior parietal lesion, which uh, we were not uh, not able to understand what the lesion was before surgery. So, Doctor Barnett, just a deep seated lesion. Doctor Barnett decided to do autolit. One good thing about autolit, which we all should understand, is that we'll be able to biopsy that and send it for a frozen and have a diagnosis if you don't have a diagnosis and if it's a deep-seated lesion. So that came up to be a schwannoma, intraparenchymal schwannoma. I'm sure you have heard of it. I've seen Dr. Barnett presenting it in some conference, one of the conferences which I also attended. So, uh, so it is one point that I want to uh, tell everybody is that autolit not only helps you treat, it will help you to diagnose what it is. Especially you have a, a confusion whether it's a tumor necrosis or a, uh, or it's a, whether it's a recurrent tumor. You have a diagnosis uh, at the end of the procedure because it's, you can send it for frozen. Now, uh, I, I remember uh, using it for uh, metastasis of my memories, right? You showed a slide showing metastasis not being treated. Why did they stop? Uh, exactly. Using it I for think... I think pure first diagnosed metastasis, this, this is a very nice actually question. Pure first diagnosed metastasis is no reason to do lead because the gamma knife works better than lead. Even okay. if you lead it, it comes back because uh, the, the amount of uh, radiation that you deliver with gamma knife is much, much intense and better than lead. Okay. But the, 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 uh, the application of lead comes when this is a recurrent metastasis. Then you have like component of radiation, necrosis and metastasis. So, Actually, we have a very nice cassette. We go there, we biopsy it, we lead it, okay? So 
when we send the biopsy, the neuropathologist tell us how many percentage is necrosis. If they say like 80% necrosis, then we don't treat it, redo with radiation because okay. it increased the chance, okay. chance of radiation necrosis. We just watch it with another MRI in one month to six weeks to see if it's growing and then follow it up. If it grows, then we take a risk and we retreat it. But if it comes back like 80% metastasis, just 20% necrosis, then we retreat it right away. This is also the, the thing that you mentioned. Biopsy is very helpful. We lead it anyway when it's recurrent, but the fact that we do radiation or not is based on the percentage of the necrosis. And the last thing that I wanted to mention, when you lead it, you make it a very nice cavity for radi radiation oncologists. If they want to, to, to radiate, it's much easier than this shape that is like this. Then uh, next question is, uh, what about cavernomas? I think uh, they've uh, treated, it, uh, treated some cavernomas with it, am I right? Exactly, so we published the data so the concept is like uh, burning the tissue to prevent the future seizure. So I think uh, I think it's, it's feasible, especially in deep seated ones that they, they don't want to risk for the surgery. I think it's feasible, but it's still a lot of room to see like, like you, you get the same, same as surgical outcomes if they are deep seated. So because you get the whole area around it, and then this is the area that is very susceptible to the seizure. So, so you just burn the whole area and then you, you kill the seizure. Uh, product production source. So uh, these uh, patients had a better seizure outcome after autolyte, am I right? Is that right? It's, it's, it's really hard to say because we don't have like a real comparison, but mm -hmm. I think from the de neurological deficit is, is very comparable with the surgery and obviously it's, it's very a small incision and the patient goes home very fast, you don't open the brain. So I think it's, this is just a concept, but I, it has to be really go forward to see what happens but the seizure outcomes are really good because uh, you you just burn the whole seizure the area that produce seizures all right and uh, what uh, i rem i remember you mentioning about uh, use in butterfly glamours did you say that it's not being used because what i remember is uh, autolyte they used to say that if you have a butterfly glioma you can go from one uh, one frontal lobe across the callosum to the opposite side and no, uh, treat the now, entire entire length from left to right exactly. so so now because i, I always ask them uh, of your people so uh, we, we, we we i always update myself with their concept so Normally, when a small butterfly, you use one trajectory, this side for right side, one trajectory for left side, you do two trajectories. And then, but if it's a diffuse uh, butterfly, I don't think that uh, you can burn it, but I don't think the outcome is really different yes. at the end. So yes. this yes. is the reason that they stop to do that. But a small limited butterfly, I think is a good option. It's better than biopsy itself for sure. I mean, the cohort study showed, but uh, it's no prospective study because they are not common tumor to do like random clinical trials, but, but the core the study showed the outcome is much better than biopsy because it's a cytorhythmic reduction, right? You you is like removing the tumor, but it's very diffuse. I don't think it's really it's just it's just a process. I don't think it really helps the patient. Uh, what about an epilepsy? I remember uh, Dr. Bengaman uh, and his group uh, doing a couple of epilepsy cases there, especially uh, in mesial temporal sclerosis and lesional epilepsy. Uh, I think uh, it's, a, it's it's a still uh, is a still another option for epilepsy, which very commonly used. Obviously, uh, because my my partner Dr. Alada also use it. So uh, if it's surgically accessible, they prefer to do resection because the outcome is better. But if it's not really uh, resectable and or is is recurrent, uh, so I think the, uh, is a very good option. I think it's a little bit the percentage of the seizure control is a little bit less than surgery. Okay, okay, I understand. But for yeah, radiation so necrosis, sometimes we see radiation necrosis that they are uh, producing seizure. It's amazing. You go there and you burn burn the whole thing, and then you can get the seizure control. Okay, okay, all right. And I think uh, Dr. Kwan wants to bring it to Japan. Okay. <laughs> okay. Now, uh, one question about this ICG use. I saw that uh, uh, slide yeah. with ICG showing both uh, IC, um, IC uh, uh, internal carotid arteries during trans. Do you use it regularly for your transpinoid no, surgeries? I mean, we, we have it, but I really, this was just to show how it works. But uh, I started to use it in the ones that the carotids are very like close to the field, close together. I think in that one, it's very useful to get the concept. Uh, but it's not really necessary because we have navigation and Doppler ultrasound. We, you can always check the code. If it's far, it's not really useful. It's some complex tumor that you are in the middle of like close to the carotid. It's useful to see where the carotid goes and where exactly the carotid is. Okay. 
All right. Uh, can you tell a few uh, points to uh, that you would check when you look for the flap, uh, the Hadad flap uh, using ICG? What are uh, what all things do you look at? What are the a few key points that you look at? So I, because I that's a that's a very good uh, concept. I mean, uh, many a times exactly. you have a problem, and then you don't know whether you are going to put it back or whether patient is going to have problem. Exactly. Whether you so can use I don't. I don't have that much experience with uh, using ICG in Hadad Flap, but I saw it when I was in Pittsburgh. I think they published the data. We can look at it together. So I think they they look at how how shiny it shines really. If it's if it's like the the whole the whole area shines, then this is a good flap. Um, but but if it's very very shallow and really doesn't enhance, then then is the one that's uh, is really they they don't trust it as a good flap. And it's a very high flow CSF leak. You know, we published a study about uh, the, the worst CSF leaks are posterior fossa le CSF leaks. They are not anterior fossa CSF leaks. So like chordoma and meningioma through the endoscopy. So I think it should be, uh, if it's like that, then they can they can use like more, uh, uh, so better to, to look for better flaps, at least like put a lumbar drain and then see th what other uh, factors they can, start to, to prevent the CSF leak. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, yeah, Rasvi. It was wonderful uh, seeing you. Nostalgic to see my exactly. old uh, place and my great. old friends and my teachers. And Hopefully teachers. you can okay. come and visit us here. Yeah, sure, sure. Yes. Say hi to all of them. Say hi to uh, Dr. Rezinos, uh, yeah. uh, Varun. And Varun was the chief resident then. I, re I still remember working with him. Uh, Dr. Okay. Barnett, uh, Angelo. Dr. Vogelbaum. All right, any more questions, uh, anybody? And uh, probably uh, the stages, stage goes back to Dr. Liu. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Vijay. Uh, thanks uh, for a very nice discussion and presentation. Uh, I would like to thank uh, both speaker, Professor Francisco and Professor Hamid, and both our uh, chair, Professor Klaus and Professor Vijay. So we, I will wind up the session today. On behalf of the Education Committee of the SNS and the President, Professor Yukato, I would like to thank both speakers of today, Professor Francisco Dimeko and Professor Hamid Bohi Razavi, as well as Prof, uh, Chair of Professor Klaus uh, Resch and Professor BJ uh, for the time and support for the SNS webinar. I would also like to express my sincere gratitude to Professor Zubin for broadcasting this webinar on WeChat channel. And today we have around 650 people who join us from all different platform. So till we meet again on Saturday is bye bye from all of us. Uh, thank you for joining. Thank you, Professor.